Before we jump into the passage, I just want to ask you guys a question. How many of you have ever worked hard on something? Yeah, I can tell a lot of you guys work hard on your music, some more than others. Um, but you guys work hard on that. How about in school? How many of you guys have ever worked hard on a project or a paper or anything along those lines? Yeah, okay, good. I was hoping that that would be the case. All right, well, imagine this scenario since you guys apparently are all hard workers. All right, you, you have this big project coming up. It turns out it's going to be 700% of your grade. So you know that you got to do a good job, otherwise there's a slight chance you'll fail the class. So you're like, man, I got to do a really good job on this project. So you work hard, you stay up late, you do a lot of research, you're writing, you're getting people to proofread it, you know, you're just, you know, hanging out and asking strangers to if they think what you've written is good and things like that because you just really want this to be good. You've been like eating and breathing this project because you want it to be a great one. All right, so you get it all done and you know, you're tired because you've been living off of energy drinks and Doritos for, you know, days because you haven't had time to do anything except for work on this project. Okay, maybe you guys have never done a project quite like that, but maybe. We'll just, for the story, We'll say that you did. And then you walk into class, okay, and this is the day. And you're about to turn it in. So you have it, and it's like, ah, you know. <laughs> if I could sing the Lion King music, I would. But um, you have it, and you're ready to turn it in. And right before you give it to the teacher or set it on the desk, you choose to rip it up and just throw it in the trash. Does that seem crazy? How many of you guys would ever do that? How many of you guys would that ever cross your mind? Why not? This is the part where you can answer out loud. Because you worked hard. Because you put a lot of effort on it. Because you spent yourself on this. And when you work on something, it matters to you. It's important and you find it to be valuable and you don't want it to be wasted. You don't want your permanently orange fingers that, from all those Doritos you ate to go to waste. So you want to make sure that you turn that paper in. You want to make sure that it gets to where it's going. So instead of ripping it up or, you know, balling it up or crushing it or breaking it or trashing it, you would carefully, you know, take it out of your backpack and gingerly, gingerly, sorry, that was a bug. Uh, I, I wasn't just like dancing up here. But, um, uh, you know, give it to the right person at the right time uh, and, and that would be satisfying to you to know, hey, I did a good job, I worked hard, and, and I'm, I'm giving this paper to who it needs to get to. Now, what if, as you're about to turn it in, somebody, Steve, because they're always named Steve, just kidding, it could be anyone, somebody swoops in and snags that paper out of your hands and runs away with it or rips it up or something like that. How would you feel about that? Shotgun. <laughs> Shotgun. Uh -oh. Yeah, you'd be pretty upset. You'd be pretty disturbed. So if you saw someone coming for your project, you might try to protect it, right? You might be like, mm-mm, girl, no. I don't think so, right? But now in this story, Steve's a girl, but don't worry about it. Um, Steve is not a girl. But uh, yeah, you would try and protect your paper or your project from whoever it is that's coming to destroy it because it means something to you, because it's valuable to you, because you worked hard on it, because you've spent yourself on it. You would try to protect it because it's valuable to you. And just like we try to protect what's important to us, Christ wants to protect what's important to him. And yesterday we talked about the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, which says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And from that verse we can see that we are valuable to God because he has given us new life. And it isn't just a, a gift that didn't cost him anything. It was expensive because our new life cost him his life. The cross is such an incredible thing because we can recognize that Jesus took our place and paid the price for our sins even though he had never done anything wrong and bore the wrath of God for the sins that we had committed so that we could have this new life with him. So we can see that Christ values us so much that he chose to die on the cross so that he could be with you. Just let that sink in. There is a person who values a relationship with you, who values you so much that he died to be with you. 
That's amazing. And because he loves you so much, he wants to protect you. He wants to take care of you. You know, parents want to protect their children from, from bad things, from dangerous things. You know, when I was a kid, um, my dad probably would not have let me, like, play kickball in an interstate. Why not? Because it would be super dangerous, although probably very fun. Super dangerous. And so no matter what, you know, when, when small Kelly goes, you know, Dad, I want to play kickball. And, like, and he's like, no. And I'm like, but it'll be like Frogger kickball. And I'll be trying to get out of the way of the cars. And it'll be so fun. And Dad, please, 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 please. Is my dad going to be like, okay, well, I love you, so yes. <laughs> no. If he did that, he would not love me, right? He would be giving me what I asked for but he would be putting me in a position to be destroyed. So because my dad valued me as a child and, and loved me, he wanted to protect me. So believe it or not, there was no interstate kickball. Didn't happen because my parents cared about me. Also, I didn't think about it back then, so it didn't actually come up. But uh, if it did, that was, would be how the conversation went. Parents want to protect their children from dangers, and parents want to do what's best for their children. And the Bible repeatedly, repeatedly calls us the children of God. And our God is a father, the Bible is clear, who loves us better than any earthly father does. You know, uh, Jesus tells this great story. He says, you know, if any of your children, talking to, to dads, asks you for a fish, how many of you guys are going to give them a snake? And the answer is nobody. And if, if any of you, your children asks you for a piece of bread, how many of you are going to give him a rock and be like, ha, 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 try to eat this? <laughs> Nobody does that. And he says, and how much more, you know, does our heavenly Father love us than, than us earthly people love each other? And that's the way it is. Our God loves us and values us and wants to protect us because we are his children and he is our Father. So, we're going to read Colossians 3, 5 through 11. It's a big chunk. So you've got to focus. But I want you to keep in mind, this idea that God loves us, that we're valuable to him, and that he speaks to us because he cares about us as we read this. Check it out. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. I don't know about you guys, but uh, there's, I noticed there's a ton of stuff there, and there's no way that we have time today to actually break all of this down. But we are going to hit some of the main points. And the first thing I want to mention to you guys is this. That when we read this, it's easy to see a list of rules and to think that this is saying to us, be good. To think that God is looking down and saying, you guys need to be good little boys and girls. Just need to act right and do right because that's how you please me. And that's not at all what this is saying. This is saying that God wants to us to avoid these sins because sin destroys people's lives. Okay? He loves us and he values us and he proved that like we mentioned earlier, by dying for us. And he loves us so much that he wants to protect us from choosing to destroy our lives through sin. If you were a child and you were holding on to a bottle of poison, your parent would get that away from you. They would never let you drink it, no matter how good it tasted, because the poison would kill you. And sin is poison. And God, in this passage, is basically saying, don't drink it. Don't let it be a part of your life because he loves us, not because he loves rules. I, I want you guys to get this. God doesn't love rules. He loves you. And the reason he gives us these guidelines and the structure and the plan that he offers us in the Bible is not so that we can be good enough so that he'll be pleased with us, but because he wants us 
to live lives where we don't destroy ourselves and where we can know him best and where we can follow him most and where we can belong to him only. Do you guys understand the distinction? Yes? No? Maybe? I hope so. Check out what it said in verse 6. I'm going to reread this real quick. Because of these sins, and there was a whole list, the anger of God is coming. So we can see that God is angry with sin and that there are absolutely real consequences for sin. So let me ask, does it make sense for us to anger the person who loved us enough to die for us like we talked about earlier? Like he gave up his own life for you and sin makes him angry. Does it make sense for us as people who say we want to love God with everything we are to choose to do something deliberately that we know makes God angry? Does that make sense? No, no not at all. It doesn't at all. It'd be like somebody giving you a birthday present and you're like, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate this gift. And then you're just like, Psh, smack them straight in the face. And, they, and the, they would, that doesn't make any sense, right? And like, oh, I love you so much that I want to hate you. That, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and that's when we say that we accept the gift of the gospel, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We need to understand that, that loving him plays out in how we live our lives. And when we choose to accept the gift but chill, still choose to love sin, there is a serious problem. But this passage continues, verse, chapter, verse 7 says, You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. And that means me. Every single person. But that is not how it has to be anymore. That's not how it has to be anymore. And our lives, like we talked about yesterday, should be completely different once we become Christians than they were before. It should be night and day. Like we talked about yesterday, we have a new identity in Christ. We are, we are different. Our life is now found in Him. He defines us as we read. Christ now is our life. Our identity is completely changed and wrapped up in Him. And there's no room for sin anymore. There's no room for lesser things anymore. And verse 11 says this, In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. This is saying it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done, and it doesn't matter where you've been. God loves you. And your life should be completely lived for him. You know, we ask the question, well, you know, why can't I just live for God sometimes, but also, you know, live my way sometimes? The reality is that's just not love. Love is something that is overwhelming and completing and defining. And it's not a game that you can play. And so many of us want to play the game of Christianity. We want to get a couple points here so that we can spend them over here. And that's not what it's about. It's not being, uh, getting a little bit better or following God a little bit more. It's about loving him with every part of who you are. We talked about this in Brian's Devos last night just a little bit, that Jesus doesn't call, him, call us even to put him first. But when we read the greatest commandment, it says to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It doesn't say with the first part of your heart. It says with all of your heart. Every bit of who you are is supposed to be about him, and that's it. And that's absolutely it. And so when we recognize that he made us and he saved us and he's always with us and he's made a perfect heaven so that we could be with him forever, it should change everything. And we should recognize that Christ is all that matters and he lives in us. So what we need to do is look into our lives and take note of the areas where we fail to follow Christ. To recognize where we choose to love other things instead of loving him. Because if we don't look around and see and we just go on cruise control, there can be a lot of things tacked onto our life that don't please God that we never even take the time to think about or make an effort to overcome. It reminds me of a story uh, about my grandma. I have a grandma, actually two. Uh, but 
One of my grandmothers uh, lived with us, we call her Midgey. Um, so for the rest of this story, I'll refer to her as Midgey. She is awesome. And uh, I hope that one day, all of you guys get a chance to meet her or somebody like her because she is very cool and she will destroy you in Upwards or Scrabble. But, um, but, we were going to the same church at the time because we were, my family and her, we were living uh, close together and uh, we went to this church that was growing so they did a construction project. Okay, and uh, so all around the church there's construction stuff going on. Things were being built and there's piles of this and wood over here and, um, but around the parking area they put up a construction fence. Okay, have you guys ever seen a construction fence? It's like uh, orange plastic and it's staked into the ground all around and uh, to keep you from going the places that you shouldn't go. So my grandmother, because she's a grandmother, uh, maybe didn't notice the orange plastic and uh, didn't see the construction fence. And so when she parked her car there, she may have backed completely onto the fence. And uh, then when she left church that day, she ended up dragging an entire fence home with like. <laughs> Uh, a whole, like I'm talking about 100 feet or more of, of construction fence behind her car all the way home. And we actually, um, it, was pretty, it worked out for us because we put it up in our attic because like, we like, wanted to create a ping pong room. But that's a story for another day. But a ton of, of footage, footage, feetage, length, a ton of length of fence just hanging behind uh, the car as she drove home. And can you imagine other people going along, probably beeping at her like, hey, like for 100 feet behind you, there's an orange fence hanging behind your car, bouncing. I mean, the stakes are connected to it. It's just, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but she never noticed. Which leads me to believe she may have never looked in her rear view mirror. <laughs> Which leads me to believe that old drivers are scary. But, um, but all that to say is she needed to take note of what was going on because if she had noticed that she was dragging a fence of that magnitude behind her car, there's no way she would have just kept cruising down the highway because it was, it was completely unsafe and ridiculous. Okay, so she should have taken note of what was going on so that she could have made an important change. Luckily nothing dangerous happened. One of those stakes didn't fly up and hurt anybody and it all, it's a funny story to us now. But that's not how it had to be. You know, it was a dangerous situation. And for us, it's so important that we look into our lives and recognize the areas where we struggle or the areas where we are choosing sin over Christ. And we decide to put a stop to that. You know, and, and the reality is that sin is a difficult thing and it can seem difficult or sometimes even impossible to let go of some sins in your life. And some of you guys may have tried and struggled with sin and, and failed to overcome it before or you may have become frustrated or tired or determined that, that you're not even going to try. But can I tell you that there's good news for you? That this passage ends by telling us that Christ lives in all of us and that we can overcome sin through his power and he can do things in you to make you into the person that he has created you to be that you could never do on your own. There is nothing that our God cannot do. There is not one thing that our God cannot do. He can change you. He can overcome your sins and your struggles and your issues and your pain. And he does this because he loves us, because he wants to protect us, because we're valuable to him. And in a second, I'm going to reread this little passage uh, from Colossians 3. And as I do, I, I really want you guys to take a moment to look into your lives, to consider what sins you need to be free from, what needs to change, what's the poison that you are putting into your life that you need to get rid of. You know, Psalm 139, you know, says that, this great line, the psalmist says, search me, you know, search me and show me if there's any wicked way in me. Calls on God to look inside him. And then he says, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in your way that lasts forever. Lead me in the way that is perfect because you are God. He's saying, don't let me be stuck in the ways of this world. But show me anything in my life that displeases you. Because I want to be all about you. So listen to this and, and consider your life.
So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. And you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. And some of you didn't need all that time or a list of sins to know the things that you struggle with. In fact, I think most of us are aware of where we fail. And we're completely cognizant of the ways that we choose sin instead of God. And a lot of us uh, struggle. You know, I, I'm convinced that even here at, at Chehi, the, the face that we put on, even though we are people who love God, so many of you guys I know are struggling. And so many of you desperately don't want anyone to know who you really are. And so many of you have secrets in your life and, and issues uh, that are buried down deep that you feel like defines you. But there's only one thing that defines you if you know Christ. And that's him. And that's what he's done for us. And that's being an adopted child of the one true living God. And that is awesome. And I just want to share with you guys. First, let me check. Okay, I still got a little time. I just want to share with you guys a little bit about my own life. Okay? Because a lot of times we talk about sin and we feel like it's something that's far away. Or we feel like or, uh, it's just something that we are alone in. But the reality is that we all struggle. Every single one of us struggles with something. And, and we struggle with putting things before God. Or like this passage said, making idols. Worshipping the things of this world. Seeking satisfaction in things that are not Christ. And there was a period in my life when I struggled with sexual sin in the form of pornography. And you guys, I know that's weird to say here at Che, probably not what you expected to talk about here. But I want to be honest with you because we need to be honest with each other and with God. Okay? You guys know what I'm saying? And the way that you overcome sin, and the way that you overcome these struggles, is not absolutely is not only by working hard. It is important to persevere, but that is not the whole answer. And it is not just by being accountable and finding someone to be there for you. That is so important, but that's not it. The key in my life, and I know that it can be in yours too, in overcoming sin, is simply this. That Jesus Christ is more beautiful, okay? He is more beautiful than anything else. That he is more glorious than anything else. That he is more satisfying than anything else that you could find. Completely, completely beyond anything else. And I don't, I don't tell you this because I want you guys to think differently of me. I tell you this because I want you guys to see that God is awesome. And I am not defined by how good I am or I was or mistakes I've made in my past, but by Jesus Christ and his grace. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? And the reality is anything else where we try to find joy and satisfaction and meaning and beauty and hope is fake and weak and cheap. And there is only one thing one thing that really will give you the satisfaction that you need, that you crave, that you desire. And that is your God. A relationship with him because ultimately the Bible is clear that he is our reward and there is nothing else. He is it. It is completely and totally all about him. And if you're looking to anything else, if you are looking to anything else, you're missing it. There is nothing that can take his place. And when you understand that he is so much better, it changes everything. And when you understand that he is so much more beautiful, it turns your life upside down. And you don't even want what used to, to lure you. 
That stuff, anything, whatever it is, it looks, it looks like what it is. Counterfeit, cheap, weak. And so for those of us who struggle, which believe it or not is all of us, take the opportunity to be, to be honest, to ask God to look into your life to show you where your sins are. But recognize the key to overcoming is just wanting God more than you want anything else. Because he is more beautiful than anything else. And I love this. I love how this passage ends saying that no matter who we are, Christ is all that matters and he lives in us. And you are worth so much to him. You are worth so much to him that he doesn't want to let anything get in the way of his relationship with you. So, today, as you're going about your business, as you're dealing with, with uh, the things of camp, doing practice, uh, whatever you need to do, please don't let it push out of your mind the need that you have to make things right with God. Because if you just cruise through this camp and go through the motions and feel good because we have some sweet four-part, five-part, million-part harmony going on, you're missing out. Because this camp is not about getting hyped up. It's about getting right. It's about loving God more. It's about following Him more closely. It's about being real with Him and having a relationship that's not just something we say, but something that we live because it does drive us. This is my last thought, and this is where really it has to do with your mind, is the word repent in the Bible is so key, and it comes up often, and I wish we had time to go into it more, but really the essence of what it means is simply to turn around. You're going this way, and then you turn around, and you're going this way. That's what it means to repent, to turn around, or literally what the word means, to change your mind, okay? So if it, what it all comes down to and what Jesus calls us to do in the face of sin and the struggles and the counterfeit beauty and satisfaction that, we, that just attracts us in this life. When we see ourselves pulling towards that, turning towards that, repent. Turn around. Change your mind. Understand that Jesus is better. And I cannot, under, I cannot overstate this. Jesus is so much better. And for those of you who uh, feel the weight of guilt and sin and shame, understand that our God is a God who gives you grace. And it says in 1 John 1 that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all of it. He's not up there waving his finger at you and saying, get better, get clean, and then you can come to me. He's saying, come to me now because I love you. And we should want to turn to him. We should want to focus on him. We should want to change our minds to make everything about him. Because he is more glorious than anything else. He is more beautiful than anything else. And anything else that you try to find meaning in, satisfaction in, and joy in, when you put the weight of your expectations and hope and worship on those things, they will crumble. There is only one thing that can stand up to the satisfaction can stand up to us putting all of our hope in it. And that is Jesus and his gospel. Anything else that you hope in will fail you, but he never will. If you guys have something that um, comes to your mind and that you don't know how to deal with or anything like that, today you can talk to your counselor. You can talk to me. You can talk to a faculty member. Um, ultimately, we are all here to serve you, okay? We're here to serve you. So whatever you need, we will be there for you. Let's pray. Uh, dear Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for what you've done for us. And we thank you that, that you value us so much that you do not want us to poison our lives with sin. That you do not want to allow one thing to come between us and you. God, you say in your word that you are all that matters. And yet somehow, we matter to you. 
And God, we just thank you for that because we know it's not because we deserve it, but because you are good. And the incredible privilege that, that we have of being your children just changes everything about who we are and how we live. God, help us to seek you and to seek you only. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.